so thank you for coming today. I'm going to be talking about social network analysis. And um, I'm going to try to cover it from the beginning in a few different areas. And that's really a lot in um, the time we have. Um, so I'll be looking for questions at the end if there's anything you feel like you want me to hit on one more time. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to introduce social network analysis as an analytical tool. Um, it is a method, and I'll go through a little bit of background on what that means and what that looks like. Then I'm going to go through a few examples um, from the literature, some more fun examples. Um, for example, political bipartisanship. There's a nice visual for that. Terrorism, I'm not going to call that a fun example, but it's a very nice visual example. Um, how it's used in business, and then even how it's used with the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon game. Um, then I'm going to look at a few examples from my own research, in particular some evaluative studies of health councils and fellowship programs, um, and also a study on gender and co-authorship at the University of Southern Mississippi, where I was before I uh, came here. Um, so social network analysis is somewhat new, but it's actually not. It draws on a lot of different disciplines, and it actually contributes to a lot of different disciplines. So it pulls from gra graph theory, for example, um, when we're looking at a lot of our metrics in social network analysis. And it also pulls a lot from social psychology, especially the focus on small groups, um, small groups being networks of people within society. Um, so sometimes you might look at example uh, at, at families as the unit of analysis. Um, but re you're really looking at what those relationships mean in social network analysis, what relationships between actors, how they develop, uh, what people get out of them. So if you're accessing resources through your network, if you're learning behaviors through your network, or you could even look at what is the structure of a network and what does that mean? So what does it mean if the network's very tight, if most people know each other, or if it's very loose and most people don't know each other? Um, and so we also draw on social psychology here in that we understand networks have meaning, right? So we know that within membership of these networks that there's benefits um, and there's also obligations. There's also um, meaning as far as social learning, for example, as the network structure might impact health behaviors as far as smoking or obesity. And those are some of the examples I'll go through today. OK, so what is social network analysis? I started this on the last slide, but it's really the study of relationships. It is not social media, necessarily. A lot of people um, will respond when I say, I study social network analysis. They say, oh, I have Facebook. It's not the same. It's one form of relationships, right? Um, so a lot of more recent social network analysis looks at big data. And that's one form of social network analysis where you could look at Twitter relationships or LinkedIn, something like that. So that's one form of social network analysis. But it's not actually the method. The method of social network analysis really goes back as far as the 1920s. Um, so we're looking at the relationships between social actors, and those don't have to be humans. It could be corporations, it could be dolphins, it could be, you know, um, animals. Um, it could be flight paths, for example, is one of the examples, is one of the, the visuals I'll show you. So it's used across disciplines in different ways, right? In sociology, we're probably not looking at dolphins, but we're looking at the resources people have through their relationships. Whereas in political science, um, they're probably not looking at social capital in the same way, but they might be looking at bipartisan networks or terrorist networks. Um, so it differs from traditional approaches that focus on attributes. So for example, in public health, um, from a traditional approach, we might look at one person and say, they have these health behaviors because they have these demographics, these personal characteristics. And this is a deviation from that because it says, yes, they have personal characteristics, but their network also matters. I can also explain some of their health behaviors by the people around them, by the people immediately around them, by the resources they have through those people, um, by what that person thinks those people believe as far as health and, and so forth. Um, so it focuses on interdependence, and it theorizes that structure affects substantive outcomes. So it's not just that we map it, it's that there's, there's changes in behavior based on what we see in the network. So it has a distinctive methodology for collecting data, for statistical analysis, and for visual representation. Once I get into the network maps, um, all of this will make more sense because you'll see exactly what they all have in common, exactly what I'm talking about, I think. Um, but we're really looking at both cause and effect. 
just like a lot of research, how we collect the data, how we analyze the data, um, how we represent the data is all going to come down to our research question, just like any other method. Um, we're looking at some relationship, we're capturing data about that relationship, and we're analyzing data to go back to our research question. So when we're looking at causes, we're often looking at determinants, social determinants of why we do what we do, um, why we are where we are in the network. So that might be personality. If you have a certain personality, you might be more likely to be the center of the network, right? So if we took this whole room and we had a social, somebody's going to come out at the center of the network and they're probably going to be more outgoing, right? Then there's going to be people that are more on the periphery of the network and they're probably going to be um, less outgoing. Um, so we also look at similarity. So if we had a social right now, um, I think most of the people in the front row um, they have something in common. <laughs> They're all in the same department. And that's going to be homophily. So basically, birds of a feather flock together kind of thing is you're going to trend towards people that have something in common with you. You see this in every network, most networks actually, that you can imagine. But we also look at substantive effects. So determinants might cause the development of the network or some outcome, but substantive effects um, might be what you're getting from the network. So how does information flow from the network? Or how does one actor, based on their position, have more influence or less influence within the network? Um, this also, when we're talking about health, it poses risk or opportunities. If you're looking at a network of needle sharing, right? you probably don't want to be in the center of the network. It's probably not a good place to be if you're looking at risk. Um, but if you're looking at a network of wealth and power, which is one we'll look at today, you might want to be at the center of a network. Um, so there's different opportunities afforded by your position in the network. Um, and then before we get to examples, one more background slide. So there's two types of network analysis. The examples I'm going to go through today are all bounded network analyses. Um, an ego network is different. It focuses on one person, and it's a cognitive network. So it's used because it can be um, embedded within traditional surveys. It can be used with random sampling. So that means that it can be subjected to the statistical techniques that most, most people are familiar with. Um, and with random sampling, that works. Um, the other one, the one that all my examples um, draw from today, is a bounded network. That basically means that if you took a roster of some sort and you wanted to develop a network of the people on that roster. So if everybody signed in to come into this room and then I asked all of you how well you know every other person on that roster, then I could develop a bounded network. Um, so it looks at relationships among an established set of respondents. Um, and can it be used for subgroup analysis? So I could determine from that data if there's clicks in the room, um, if who would be the central actors, um, who might not know anybody, who might be isolates or on the periphery. You know only a few people. Um, so these are the two, and we'll go forward with the bounded network analysis. OK, our first example. And I think they'll start making more sense. Everything I just said was very, I think, terminology heavy. And these kind of pull all of that out to make it manageable, I guess. So this is a network of um, the hijackers from uh, the terrorist attacks of September 11th. And not just the hijackers, but their affiliates as well, anybody involved. So you can see here that we have the pilots in blue, I mean, in circles. And this means that also in social network analysis, we're looking at relationships where each object here is a person. Each line shows a relationship. So as I went on saying we have specific visuals. It's always some kind of form of this. But we overlay attributes by shapes, colors. But we could put little dots in there. We have ways to show that there's different attributes between these characters. Um, so if I look at this, one thing that I would think is, if I was the government analyzing this, is I want to know what's happening with these people right here. Because this person obviously poses a threat. Look, his centrality or his degrees. He has one, two, three, four. He has a lot of connections, right? Um, we can see that that's similar among most of the people who were hijackers or pilots. So I actually looked up what happened to these people. This person's at Guantanamo, and these people are dead. They probably did the same thing. 
I'm sure that there was a lot of analysis on um, the different people in this network. Um, but if you are a business, for example, and you're reading this, and this is your employees, you might promote this person, right? You might not kill them, you would promote them. Um, so you'd have a different approach based on whatever your purpose was in using this network. Um, let's see. So we see um, also in bipartisan politics, there's a lot of social network analysis. Who votes with whom, right? So if we just looked at more of a, a traditional um, visual, we can see over time that they've spread. So what I'm talking about, there's, there's more traditional approaches, there's social network approaches. Um, basically, they just mapped who was voting with who and how that changed over time. And that gave you a good idea of how are we more bipartisan than we used to be? The answer is yes. Um, here's another example. So there's a lot of social network analysis in public health. It's used in many different ways. Um, but probably the most common way in public health is the diffusion of health behaviors, both good and bad. Um, so from, for example, a, a differential association perspective, um, bad behaviors. Um, drug use, for example. Um, but here we see an example of how does a good behavior, being stopping smoking, how does something like that change in a network? And we can see um, on the left we have a network from 1971, and on the right we have a network from 2000. The main thing you can see, um, once we know that non-smokers are light green, smokers are orange, we can see, just see a pretty distinct change between the two networks. Um, so here, we had 45% of people were smoking, 21% of people were smoking. So we can see that in, in our statistics as well. But more importantly, from a social network perspective, we can see that in 1971, smokers were central to the cliques within the network. And in 2000, smokers are peripheral to the cliques within the network. Um, so they found that once these people start smoking, the people who are at the center of most of these social networks, that it spread through those clicks, and the people on the outside are going to be the last to change, or never, um, if they haven't changed in four decades. Um, but they also found that it really depends on who these people are. For example, if it's your neighbor, your neighbors don't have any effect on your health behavior, is what they found. They've, they found that with both smoking, with obesity. Um, so it's not always about physical proximity, it's more about social relationships. Um, so if you look up here, your spouse is going to heavily impact if your spouse quits smoking. That makes sense, though, right? It's right there in your home. Um, followed by a sibling, so somebody else that's close to you. Uh, followed by a friend and so forth. So there's different layers of our social network, which also aligns with what we know about influence from a sociological perspective. Um, so then moving more to the... Uh, business side of it, there's something called corporate interlocks, and that's how people sit on the board of different corporations. It's an issue of power structure. Um, so 78% of the top 50 companies in the S&P 500 are directly connected to one or more board members. So you might have heard the term too big to fail. There's also too connected to fail. <laughs> They're all supporting each other in some way. So they even found that there was an economic super entity, 147 companies who share, um, whose shares are entirely owned by members of the group, and three-fourths of those are banks. So this is a map of some of those here. But this really threatens economic stability as failure of one or more companies ripples through the whole economic system. So. If this is something you're interested in, there's a neat website. It's called theyrule.net. And it's really a network website where you can build any of these networks between companies. You can either come over here and you can select companies. Let's say you want to look at find connection between, I'm just going to pick up something random, mm, whatever that one is, and Amazon. And they're building a network, right? So if we added corporations to this, we would see this network develop. Basically, this person sits on Allergan, this person sits on Amazon, and they both sit on University of Southern California. Um, if you go over here under popular maps, people have done some of the work for you. Um, so if I wanted to look at this one, for example, you can see all the interconnection between how all these boards are connected. Um, so it's a fun tool. You can get a little bit lost in it if you're interested in this. That's there. Um, let's see. 
And then this is something you might recognize if you've taken a flight from the back of the flight magazine. This is just a Delta flight path network, right? This is still a network, though, because it's showing how these cities are connected. You could still apply the same metrics because it's showing how many degrees it would take to get from one city to another. If you're in Johnson City and going anywhere other than Charlotte or Atlanta, it's probably going to be two, <laughs> right? Um, so it gives you an idea of how many degrees it takes to get somewhere, just like if we were looking at a network of humans. And I included this one to show that it's not always humans, right? It could be, on the last one, it could be corporations. This one, it could be um, airplanes. And then this one. So. A lot of people of a certain age, I found, <laughs> are familiar with the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Who is familiar with this game? Okay, I stand by my statement of a certain age. <laughs> so it's a game of six degrees of separation. Um, the good thing is that I tried to stump a few students and until we got to athletes, even with it was Zac Efron, you could still play this game. <laughs> Um, so it's a game of six degrees of separation, and basically it means there's a, it's a small world. We are all connected in some way. Um, so it's also called, it's called the small world phenomenon. And it says there's a couple different theories on how connected we are. Um, for example, Horvitz and Leskovec um, found that using Microsoft IMs that everybody, most everybody in the world, um, we're connected in 6.6 .6 steps. That's not very many people between you and somebody um, far away. So Stanley Milgram wanted to test this several decades ago. Same Stanley Milgram as the Stanford experiment, so he was a prolific researcher, I think. Um, but he conducted the small world experiment, and he sent 160 packages to random people in Omaha. And he said, there's a stockbroker in Boston that needs this package, and you have to get it to him, and you cannot I guess there wasn't Google back then. <laughs> if somebody told you, you just Google it. But you have to send the package to somebody you know by name and face. And then he found that the package arrived in an average of five steps from Omaha to Boston without the internet. <laughs> um, one arrived, I think, in four days, in three steps, something like that. Um, and the longest steps of packages that made it was 10. Um, there's a lot of criticism of this, because what about the packages that didn't make it? And there's been a lot of people that have tried to repeat it. Um, but you get the idea. Basically, we're all connected if, you, um, if you're able to get it in the hands of the right people. Um, so back to Kevin Bacon. So the Oracle of Bacon is a website where you can test your knowledge <laughs> of how close Kevin Bacon is to somebody. Um, there's a more modern version of this, I guess, where it's you can get to, from any Wikipedia article to any Wikipedia article in six steps, right? And um, apparently, if you get to handguns, you can get to anybody, is something I've learned. Um, but basically, if you type in anything here, when we were testing it out, I don't think we ever had more than two intermediaries, um, because he was in a, a lot of things, um, maybe not as recently. Um, is there anybody you would want to test with that I can spell? Haley. <laughs> Who is it? Christian Bale. So Christian Bale was in Dark Knight Rises with Gary Oldman, who was in Criminal Law with Kevin Bacon. So you get how it works now. <laughs> um, I don't know if you'll be breaking out at a party soon, but you could do it with other other actors, and the idea is that there's intermediaries, you're developing a social network here, and you're looking at how many steps it takes to get between point A and point B. Okay, so those are some examples from the literature to give you a little bit of a background of what social network is, how we can use it. There are so many more ways than I listed here, but I think that those examples um, might give you a better baseline than just going through terms and and definitions in social, social network analysis. Um, so from here, I want to give you a few of the studies I've done using social network analysis. You'll see that most often I'm looking at the development of a network, so a lot of pre-post. Um, how does that change in the network increase collaboration or some outcome? And most often I'm looking at social capital and health networks. 
Um, so the first one that I want to show you is I'm looking at a health coalition. Um, at the point of this study, the coalition had been meeting for 18 months. And it's, I'm looking at hindsight, so I'm asking them about before they met. So that's not ideal, but um, you'll see how it works here. Um, but basically, with coalitions, the idea is that change is happening at the community level, that these relationships need to be in place, that a coalition is helping to form these relationships, and together, they're developing the social capital to promote some established outcome. Um, most often, though, the evaluation focuses on the outcome, on whatever health behavior, program, whatever it is they're trying to promote. And it rarely focuses on the process. Um, so what we're doing here is a little bit different than most evaluative studies of coalitions, because we're looking at how do we capture the effectiveness of the partnerships, and what does that mean in turn for the effectiveness of the coalition collectively? Um, so our research question is, what is the relationship between um, relationship progression, defined as I don't know you to I know you really well. Somewhere in between would be I would nod at you at Walmart kind of thing. Um, and increased collaboration. So how do we move from how well they know each other to how closely they're working on these health outcomes? Um, so we looked at relationships and collaboration. And we looked at the change between pre-coalition and April 2016. Um, as I mentioned, there's very specific methods in social network analysis. Um, so some of these questions highlight um, some of these data collection methods. So um, first, we ask from the list, select individuals with whom you have an established relationship, either formal or in informal. And um, so remember what I was saying with the bounded network, you have to essentially have a roster. So that means we had, as of April 2016, we had a list of everybody in the coalition, which is also why it wouldn't have worked pre-coalition, because we wouldn't be able to account for anybody that's joined in the past 18 months. So basically, that's a long survey. Because if they know 10 people, then for each of those 10 people, they're going to be asked more questions. Um, so that gets exponentially longer. Um, so how, and then for those people that they know, um, at any level above a zero, being I don't know who that is, um, we say, how frequently do you work with individ this individual um, basically on these goals? So if the goal was prenatal health, for example, you could say, I never work with them. I work with them once, uh, once a year or less, about once a year, about once a month, every week. We only work for the same organization. What kind of activities does your relationship with individual entail? This is how we're measuring level, level of collaboration. So nothing. I don't do anything with them. We only work for the same organization, cooperative, coordinated, or integrated. These are the three we're really interested in. Because cooperative is, yeah, we have common goals. Coordinated would be, we have common goals and we're working towards them. And then integrated would be, we are doing something. We are boots on the ground. We are, you know, we are working towards that common goal. Um, and then this was repeated for prior to your participation in the coalition. So that way you can capture if they were working together before, it's not the effect of the coalition. Um, so we created a symmetric relationship matrix for each of the four questions. So basically, if I said I knew Jocelyn, did she say she knew me? And we looked at a lot of dyads and reciprocity. We used UCINet social network analysis software. So just like you have um, in vivo for qualitative analysis, you have SPSS and other programs for um, quantitative analysis, you have UCINet for social network analysis. Um, you can also do social network analysis in R. There's a lot of packages in R. Um, it's the analysis, we looked at the analysis of the development of the network, the binary existence of a relationship, the increased frequency of a relationship, and the increased level of relationship in terms of collaboration. So it looks something like this. Prior to the coalition, the average person knew 4.79 people. After 18 months, the, months, the average person knew 11.3 people. Um, prior to the coalition, 5.6% of all possible relationships existed. After 18 months, 13.5% of all possible relationships existed. Prior to the coalition, no more, um, no actors were more than nine steps away from any other actors. So we were looking at like that flight path and talking about the distance across. Um, that's what we'd be looking at here is diameter and distance. Um, and then after the coalition started meeting, no actors were more than five steps away from, me, um, from any other actors. And then as far as distance, we saw a decrease here, which means that also if you wanted to get information out to the network, you could do that faster. Um, the main thing you want to see here is that 
we moved a lot of people out of never knowing each other down to knowing each other once a month. That makes perfect sense because the coalition met once a month, right? So we need to see more than that. Um, so we can look down here to move through movement through these different levels of engagement. And we moved 170 people here out of none. Um, 19, this is completely academics right here, because it says we work for the same organization, they didn't know each other. So it's people that were like in public health and sociology and had, were working on the same thing and didn't even know each other, or that they were working on the same thing. Um, but more importantly, there's, there's change here. So more people said that we are coordinating things, we are working towards these goals. Um, the main thing you want to see here is the change between the two. Um, so basically, in the top left, for example, you see relationships great, greater than zero. So if any relationship exists at any of those levels, um, and if you look at it here, you look at it here, you can see the density change. In one, two, in the whole top row, you can see the density change. That just means more relationships were formed. Um, and then you see the same thing with um, collaboration. So ideally, if we were to go back and reconduct this study, we would want to see more people moving through these different levels. But it's a great start to see change in um, greater than zero and greater than one. And you see that again, you see the density change. So we found that the percent of relationships increased, the frequency of contact increased, the level of collaboration increased, and there was also a correlation between the more often you're meeting, the more you say you're collaborating, which makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing that I didn't note here is there were three chapters meeting of one coalition, and you can visually see that. Right? You can see that this chapter is larger than the others, and they know each other. This chapter, they know each other. This chapter, they know each other. And then there's a few people that are bridging those, um, those three chapters. Um, from a social capital standpoint, you'd really want to know who those people are and what value they hold, because those people are the ones that are bringing information in between the, um, the different coalition chapters. So basically, we looked at it from other traditional, more traditional questions, like, do you think this is effective? Um, but what we found was, so far, yes, um, we're increasing relationships, we're increasing collaboration. Using our other measures, people think that these relationships are important and that they will lead to the success of the coalition. Um, but we also found that maybe we need to promote more bridging social capital, more connection between those coalitions, because really, for the most part, we have we had three networks there. We, it's hard to say this is one network, and that's completely throwing off all those metrics that we were looking at. Okay, um, so the second one I want to talk about is a study of gender and co-authorship. Um, this study was conducted at the University of Southern Mississippi, where I was before I was here, and it was funded by the Committee on Services for Women. And what they wanted to know was, are there differences in collaboration at the university in co-authorship based on gender? Um, there were differences in um, tenure, women getting tenure at a lower rate than men. And so they said, well, if publications are a big part of it, is there something different happening in, in a collaboration around publications? So we used a social network approach to see what do these relationships look like. Um, who's publishing and who's publishing with men, who's publishing with women. Um, so we compiled a list of the faculty in the nine USM Arts and Letters departments, and then we developed a database for all 111 uh, faculty. And we included, for example, the faculty's name, gender, the number of publications, number of co-authored publications, um, the gender of their co-authors, their tenure status, the date of their first publication to get an idea of how long they've been there, and or been in academia, rather, um, and if they were at the main campus or a smaller satellite campus on the Gulf Coast. Um, so then we developed sociograms, social network maps, to visually demonstrate co-publication. We compared general descriptive statistics and social network metrics between men and women, and then we revisited our research question. Um, so this is just kind of some of our descriptive statistics. We had 111 faculty, 48.2% uh, were women. The average first publication was in 2003. The, um, the average number of publications was 12.9, ranging from 1 to 73, but that's really thrown off by English 
where publications included like poems and stuff. So there was a different publication process. We also found in this that there's, and, and many of you probably know, there's really different standards of publication by discipline. For example, um, in foreign language and literature, you don't co-author apparently. And whereas my department, the department I was in, political science, international development, international affairs, it's much more common, right? Um, in history, for example, there's more emphasis on books and less um, on uh, peer-reviewed publications. So you might not have as many, but they're a heavier load. Um, so the average number of co-authored publications was 2.4, ranging from zero to 39. And we looked at publications from 1976 to 2016, and we looked at 1,420 publications overall. So that means we had an entry for all of these and for the co-authors of all of these to get an idea of what was happening there. So in our network, remember we're taking all 111 plus their co-authors, so we had 573 authors. Those would be the actors in our network. Um, however, there were 370 unique authors. So that means that if somebody kept co-authoring uh, co something with the same person, their name would keep appearing in our, in our data, but we remove them so that each person appears once. Um, then we coded our network data by department and gender. So just like you saw in the terrorist network, they coded it where you could see different symbols within the map. Um, we did the same, um, but not for terrorists, <laughs> with, for departments and gender. And we ended up with 150 three females and 216 males. So uh, I guess a little hint towards what we find is here we're, we're almost even, here we're pretty off balance, right? Um, so 44% of USM faculty had at least one co-authored publication. This is what our original numbers look like, average number of publications, average number of co-authored publications. So we see that females are more likely to co-author, but what we ultimately find is everybody's more likely to co-author with men, and we have a theory on why that is. So this is what the network looked like originally before we added any, um, any characteristics overlaid on it. And then these are the networks that we ultimately analyze. So here we have um, red is females, blue males, Black is we couldn't determine gender. And in two and three, we separated those out. So we said, um, what do the, the female networks look like? What do the male networks look like? And then back to the original question that we were trying to answer is, what does co-authorship at the university look like? And the answer is really poor, <laughs> right? Um, going from this down to this, there were, I think, it's 11 dyads. So 11 people that have co-authored together. Um, so it's not happening very uh, frequently. Um, so it came down to dia 11 dyadic co-authorships. So that would be each one of these is counted. Um, that one's actually a triad, but at a minimum of a dyad. Um, four of them were male to male. Five were female to female. Two were female to male. So there wasn't much, I mean, we didn't have much to start with there. However, we found that the female to male ratio in arts and letters was basically um, nine women to every 10 men. But when we looked at our co-authorship network, we found that there, um, for every one female faculty, there are 1.7 female co-authors in the network. And for every one male faculty, there are 2.6 um, male co-authors in the network. So across the board, people are more likely to publish with men. So for our original question, we found just a lack of co-authorship in general at the university. But we said, well, why is there a difference in co-authorship by gender outside the university? And our, the best answer we have right now is, you know, we want to do more research on this, is you're more, li you're more likely to have male mentors in academia overall, right? Um, and there's a lot of studies that show that um, at the doctoral level, males and females are perceived to have different mentorship needs. Um, where females need emotional support, men need career advice. Um, but it comes down to, from what we can tell, physical proximity. Um, a lot of networks are just who you're near, right? Um, so if you're near um, your mentors, you're going to publish with them. But um, especially, it's, it's changing slightly, um, 
But males are more likely to hold mentorship positions in academia. They're more likely to be tenured. And um, so that means they might be more likely to be co-authors to early career academics. And that might be what we're picking up on in the network. Um, this is just one slide about a study. It was a fellows program. We had 23 individuals in the fellows program. And in our mind, they're going through a 16-week fellowship. They're gaining all these skills, gaining all these resources, but people are also resources, right? Um, so if they have the skills and resources and the network to make some kind of change in the community, that would be great. But is this happening in the program? So pre-program, this is what our network looked like. You can see in this one, I've overlaid the level of relationship. And you can see mostly ones. There's a five there. It wasn't reciprocated, I don't think. Um, but you get an idea, basically, that this isn't a very dense network, right? There's one person who doesn't know each other, know anybody. I mean, this person's an isolate, isolate, or a pendant. Um, this is after 16 weeks. So the answer is yes. We don't even need to put up any statistics. The answer is yes, that through programs like this, people develop social capital. Because now if they want to solve some kind of community problem, they have 22 new people to, or ish, to call on. And then I have one final study. Um, this one's a little bit different than the others. It has a similar purpose, but it's actually a gap analysis. So there's a federal health council. There was a federal health council that looked at minority health. It was called the Southeastern Health Equity Council, and there's ten of these count. There were ten of these councils in the United States. Um, the Southeast Health Equity Council represented eight southern states, and there were five voting members from each state. Uh, it came time to do onboarding, so people served a two-year term. And we had to say, how do we recruit? How do we know what spots we're going to be filling? Um, and how do we use what's been effective for us to fill those spots? So we did a social network gap analysis of our own organization. And we looked at a lot of different things. So one of the things we looked at was sector of people represented. States of peoples were represented. We knew we had to have five, but five people from each state doesn't mean you're going to have the same structure in each state. And then there's different councils within the um, different uh, groups within the council. Um, so first, we looked at how well are people working together, just broadly. That one's easy because we've seen that one. And then, but how well are the committees working together, and what can we learn from the committees that? are working better than others. So if you look at this one, I'd say this committee is not working too well together. This one's working pretty well, except for this person right here. So you're going to do there's different structures in the committee. But if these committees all have common goals, they should all be connected to each other. There's no reason there should be anybody in any of those committees that don't know each other. So again, we can look at the state level. And we can see Tennessee is a shining example. <laughs> Most people know each other, whereas Florida has some serious issues here. Um, but what you're really seeing here, if you, you know, if you knew who these people were, is this is the chair and the co-chair, right? So they hold leadership positions. That's why they're larger, because they have centrality within the network. These people are small. That means they're all new. That means other people don't know who they are. So. Last year, probably everybody from Florida left. You have five new people. But that also creates some policy problems within the council, right? You can use this to recognize you need mentorship, you need onboarding. Maybe you need to distribute your leadership roles across states instead of keeping them all at Vanderbilt. Um, <laughs> and whereas like Mississippi, you see the same thing, is that they're all for, um, there's four people who just aren't quite there. Um, so we also looked at who are these people, looked at race, age, um, oh, sorry, these are the, 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 who are these people in terms of what their interests are. So some people are looking at race, age, income, gender, all relative to health. Um, but more importantly, in our, in our formal documents, we say that we're supposed to represent specific areas, including media including uh, faith-based organizations and some of these other places. And really, we're mostly academics. Um, we were mostly academics. And that kind of comes down to who has the time to commit to things like this. Um, so we, we were able to use all this information to strategically 
um, developed some recommendations on how do we improve the council by identifying the sh using the structure of the council to identify what needs to happen next. Uh, for example, this is one that I mentioned, leadership positions within SHAC should be sensitive to states represented um, to ensure that actor power is distributed among states. So things like that you can draw from these networks. And then I will return here. Thank you. Um, so I, I thought it was a great presentation, and I appreciate it. Um, for any of us who do stats, you know, someone who can make stats interesting um, and kind of entertaining and sexy, it's really appreciated. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. But my question is, is there a difference in analytical rigor between a, a VEGA network and a, and a bounded network? Is one preferable to the other analytically? Yes, definitely. So if you're using a bounded network, you usually have a specific question to that network, and there's no generalizability. So I could take and repeat the methods of this check study, but these findings can't be used for any other network. So just like if you were using a case study, your findings aren't very generalizable. They're more specific to that case, and your questions are specific to that case. Whereas if you were using um, an ego network, it's all cognitive. So if you tell me that this is what your network looks like, so I'm like, yes, that's what your network looks like. Um, and that's because um, you're going to behave on what you think your network looks like. And my question is about what you think it looks like. And that's why I can use other statistical analysis. For example, I used an ego network for my dissertation, and I was able to plug it in as one of many variables in a regression. Um, like they say they know these people, then those people don't know them back. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's people that think they're a lot more popular than they are. <laughs> um, for that, we try to use really specific wording. Um, and sometimes it comes down to, like, if you're asking how you know your neighbor, they use almost traditional things like, would you be comfortable walking up and knocking on their door and would they answer it kind of thing. So we try to be as specific as possible. We're asking about influence. We try to ask about a specific behavior, a level of trust, because I might go to my mom for information on one thing. I might go to you for information on something else, depending on what exactly. So we try to be as specific. Um, but some people are going to tell you they know everybody, no matter what. <laughs> and for that, we look at that reciprocity in the dyadic relationships. Yeah. Has anyone in the studies had any, um, I guess, has it been injury happened between people because of these studies? We generally, generally try to avoid conflict and we don't go back and say, and IRB wouldn't allow us. IRB wouldn't allow us to go back and say, well, you said you were a five and they said you were a two because that would be giving away somebody else's data. Um, but like, you probably noticed there was one where I had names on there. But that was all from web scraping. So I didn't have any obligation to you know, protect those names. Um, if you, for example, on this one, I knew all of these people. So I could tell you, for example, without giving any names, that this is a professor who just started at the university this semester. So I have a way of kind of verifying, at a network of this size, of just 23, I have a way of verifying, whereas I know that this person, he's retired and he just knows everybody, and that's true, you know? Um, so it's not often that we actually go in and change anything. Every once in a while, we'll try to consider who is this person and do they actually know it? Because um, most of the time, since I don't do big data with like social media and stuff, most of the time you know something about these people or whoever's asking you to conduct it knows something about these people. Anything else? Well, thank you. Mm -hmm.